We ready. You all ready? Mm -hmm. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the North Country Missionary Baptist Church Evening Bible Study. We're in the book of Romans. We're going to end the 15th chapter and we're going to begin on the 16th. But I got a few things I want to say on the 15th chapter before I move into the 16th chapter. So, for all of you here and all of you online, we thank you for being here tonight. What a beautiful day today. What a beautiful day today. Uh, just, it's just a joy to spend a beautiful day with your loved ones and then you come into the house of worship with your other loved ones and just get to worship the Lord and serve the Lord. Amen. Yes, sir. Before we get started, we're going to bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you. Thank you. We want to thank you for looking beyond our faults and seeing our needs, Heavenly Father, before the foundation of the world. So, Heavenly Father, we owe it all to you. And tonight we just come to give you praise and give you worship. And to study your word, Heavenly Father, we pray that what is said and done tonight that somebody receive a blessing. And that you be pleased to get the glory of what we do tonight, Heavenly Father. That's what we're here for. And that's our prayer. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Again, good evening, everyone. As I mentioned in our last class, the Apostle Paul was a visionary. And he had a twofold purpose for writing this letter to the Christians in Rome. See, Paul was convinced that Rome was to play a pivotal role in the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul's desire was to take the gospel to every part of the known world. And he believed that Rome could be the springboard he needed to accomplish that task. So he wrote this letter to address the tension that was going on within the church in Rome. We found that there were some specific issues for a church that included both Jewish and Gentile Christians that had to, be that had to become a concern and needed to be clarified. Things like this. Can one be right with God through obeying the law? We find the answer to that in Romans 1, 1 through 320. And then, what can we learn from Abraham? And is he the father of both the Jews and Gentile Christians? You can find the answer to that in Romans 4, 1 through 25. Another question was, what role does the law play in reference to sin? 520 and 7, 1 through 25. And what does salvation, what does the salvation of Gentiles indicate about the further the future of Israel as God's people. And we talked about that in 9, 1 through 11, 36. Pastor called it that parenthesis. And then the final question was, should Christians observe Old Testament food laws? And how should they relate to fellow believers on such matters? We found the answer that in uh, 14th chapter of Romans, Romans verses 1 through 15. Now, all of these were very legitimate questions for the first century church. But frankly, I had to admit, these are questions that we should be asking today. Mm -hmm. Because truly, they're, they're perfect questions. Also, Paul wanted the Christians in Rome to rally around his gospel mm -hmm. so that Rome would become the base of operations by which he could proclaim the gospel in Spain. Mm -hmm. He talked about it in that, that in 15, we're talking about Romans, Romans 15, 22 through 24. For if the Roman Christians did not agree with his gospel message, especially on the issues being debated among the Jews and the Gentiles we just talked about, then they would not support his proposed mission to Spain. Paul needed to explain the gospel in some detail so that the Christians in Rome would become the base from which he could proclaim the gospel in new regions. We get a clearer picture of this letter when we look at the fact that Paul kept abreast of the shortcomings within all the churches he planted. If you notice, when he wrote to the various churches, he was specific in his community. So this tells us why he was so detailed in this letter uh, to the Romans. This is why Paul went into such detail regarding the doctrines, 
mentioned in the first eight chapters of Romans. Now you know, Apostle Paul, I'm not talking to new believers here, but Apostle Paul wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament books. Each letter serves specific purposes and addressed various aspects of Christian theology practice and encouragement. And These epistles cover a wide range of topics, including salvation, grace, sanctification, ethical living, and unity within the early Christian community. So we need to recognize and understand that Paul, as the apostle to the Gentiles, understood exactly where his new converts were in their Christian walk. And this is how he knew specifically what areas of Christian doctrine he needed to use to educate and encourage each of the various churches as it relates to their specific issues. So when we look at that, we look at, he realized that he was talking to Jew and Gentile Christian. They were Christian. But some of them were Jew and some of them were Gentiles, and they had different outlooks on life. This is first century church. This is not 21, 24. And so he had to be real specific. So when you look at the detailed doctrines of Romans 1 through 8, you understand why he did what he did, as opposed to the few doctrines he gave in Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians, and first step alone. You know what I'm saying? So, because like. And I got with, I'm not going to go to that. But Paul's letter to the Romans is a comprehensive, all inclusive treaty, binding agreement on justification by faith, the role of the law, and God's plan for both Jews and Gentiles. Paul's selections of themes the gospel of Jesus Christ, the law, the significance of Abraham being justified by faith, the future of Israel, suggest significant tension between the Jews and Gentiles and Romans. So Paul wrote Romans so that they would be united in the gospel he preached and so that they would comprehend how the gospel spoke to the issues that divided him. Romans 15, 23 goes on to tell us, but now since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, Paul has fulfilled his mandate to preach the gospel among the Gentiles from Jerusalem to Alicrim, roughly comprising what is now Albania, and also what was formerly Yugoslavia. Paul believed that his work in the eastern part of the Roman Empire had come to an end. So he hoped to see the Roman church, and it was his desire that they would function as his base of support for his missions to Spain, just as Antioch of Syria had done for his three previous missionary journeys. Now, Scripture tells us that Antioch of Syria was Paul's home base of operations, which also served as a strategic center for spreading the gospel, nurturing new believers, and addressing critical theological questions. Also, this is where Paul's ministry flourished and where the early Christians community thrived. Also, that's where they was first called Christians. Now, Paul's three missionary journeys, we took about seven years, began in Antioch. They began about 48 AD and came to an end when Paul was arrested and in prison about 55 AD in Jerusalem. The stop in Corinthians and Ephesus accounted for over half the time Paul supposedly was on the road. So Paul, Paul spent a lot of time, a lot of that seven years, almost half of it, either in Corinth or in Ephesus. He did a lot of it. He saved a lot of souls in those, in those, those cities. Before completing his third missionary journey, though, he stopped in Corinth. And it was at Corinth that Paul wrote this letter to the Christians in Rome. So we see Paul's missionary journeys, his three missionary journeys, that he encompassed the, the eastern part of all of uh, the empire, Rome, the Roman Empire. He, would, he had completed his, all of the big cities. He had given them the word. So now he realizes that he has no more room here. So now it's time for him to go. So what Paul is doing, he's writing to the Roman church to let them know, listen, I need you to understand this and I need you to get on board with what I'm talking about, my, my gospel, because truly I'm, I've got plans to go not just to you, I plan to go to Spain. My, my, my intention is to take the, the, the word of God to the world. So I need you to be on board with what I'm saying. So that's why he wrote this in-depth uh, letter to Romans. So when you look at it, when you look at Romans, you look at it 
like that, you look at it from a perspective that this apostle, and this is an apostle, do you know, I would love to have an apostle walking with me right now, you know, can you imagine having a guy who would just touch somebody and, and you heal them, or the, remember the young man who was listening to him preach and fell out the window and he, and he died and he touched the man and brought the man back to life. Now that's the type of person that you want walking with you proclaiming the gospel. Somebody, you're going to listen to that person like that. <laughs> so, you know, but that's the type of person Paul was. And he knew, just like Antioch saw who he was, and they, they was on board because they knew God was in, in, with him. So Rome needed to see the same thing in Paul so that they would be with him so he could take this message of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, to the known, to the unknown world. He needed, he needed them to understand it. So he was real specific in everything he said. So when you look at Rome, Romans, you look at it from that perspective. He just needed them to get on board with everything that the gospel message that he was giving in, in Arabia for the three years when he talked about Christ to the to the to the to the known world. He needed them to be on board with that. So that's why he was so in there. So, where we are tonight, Paul is completing his message. He has sent his message um, by way of an emissary. We're going to talk about her tonight. And he, he's, still in, he's still in Corinth, but he sends, well, he's on his way to Jerusalem because he had the, you've got to remember now, and I need to ex explain this, he had the offering that was collected. And before he went to Rome, he had to bring the offering to Jerusalem for the needy Christians in Jerusalem, right? So he sent Phoebe, he sent Phoebe with the letter to Rome. So what we see, Paul is in Corinth. This letter that he has written to the Romans has gone out to Rome, going out to the Romans. And In Romans 16, the final, the final passage of, in Paul's long letter to the Christians in Rome, it contains four sections. His greeting to specific people in Rome, mm -hmm. a quick and urgent warning about the danger of false teachers, mm -hmm. greetings from those who are with him in Corinth, and a final hymn of praise to God called a doxology. Now, the capital city of Rome was a magnet that drew people from all over the empire. In addition, Paul's travels to many of the major population centers, such as Jerusalem, Syria, and Antioch, Philippi, Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, brought him into contact with the mobile segment of Roman society. In other words, Paul was a, a big wig, and he had clout, and he traveled in them high suburbs. And it said this about these factors have explained the presence of Paul's many friends in Rome, but his knowledge, this is important too, his knowledge of their whereabouts remained a tribute to his deep concern for people. And that's just like he knew where those Christians who served with him in Corinth that had moved from, he knew where they were. He also knew about all of his churches and what they were going through. So, so when you look at Paul, you're looking at someone that had more vision than I ever imagined him to have. And you know, the more I look at Paul, the more I get excited about Paul. Yeah, because he yeah. truly was someone that, well, they don't make, there are no more apostles, there are no more prophets. We have evangelists and pastor teachers now. But, because what they say, the apostles and the prophets, they laid the foundation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing, we're building the foundation. And Amen for laying the foundation. Amen. Christ is the chief cornerstone mm -hmm. of their foundation. Hallelujah. Amen. But as I was saying, these factors have explained the presence of Paul's many friends in Rome, but his knowledge of their whereabouts remained a tribute to his deep concern for people. Mm -hmm. Paul's warmly greets those he knows in Rome who are involved in ministry, showing the love that existed among Christians. That's something to talk about, and I know that is, but we're going to move forward because truly we do need to show love to our, not only our brothers and sisters here at, in our congregation, but we're a body of Christ. So that's why it says it's unity. And we're going to talk about unity and diversity in a minute. 
But it is not surprising that he would know so many who are now in Rome. For travel was more common than modern people might think. Further, Paul may not have known every person he greeted. Perhaps he knew of some of some by virtue of their reputation. Not that Paul says, but not, but no, Paul says something about virtually every person he greeted. Paul extended personal greetings to numerous individuals in the Roman church, demonstrating the depth of his connection and his affection to his fellow workers in the gospel. It also emphasizes the power of personal connection and unity in the body of Christ. So when we look at being personally connected with one another, this ain't nothing new. This, this Bible was written over 2,000 years ago. They were doing the same thing then. And it's an encouragement to us to know that we're following in the right footsteps. And I'm, I'm encouraged that, and I realize that the more I be around the brothers and sisters in Christ, the more I want to be around the brothers and sisters in Christ. Because the more I'm here, the more I grow, the more I learn. You know, and you can't learn unless you're in class. If you're not in class, you're not going to know. And believe it or not, some people don't like the word class, mm -hmm. but believe me, the things you be learning in Sunday school and Bible study and listening to sermons, I'm like I'm in class. I thought I was retired, but <laughs> it seems like I gotta keep coming. I, mean, I can't miss it. I'm still, I'm still, I think still got me, the Lord got me busy in a different way. Yeah. And I'm thankful for yeah, that. Yeah, really yeah. blessed. Yeah. 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 It is a testament to the many unsung heroes who work with Paul in spreading the gospel. The unsung heroes, they are those individuals who play crucial roles behind the scene, yet often go unnoticed or unrecognized by the world. Yes. In the context of Romans 16, these unsung heroes are the people mentioned by Paul and his greetings. They are fellow believers who supported the early Christian community in various ways, whether through hospitality, encouragement, service. But their names might not be as well known as some of the prominent figures in the New Testament. These unsung heroes exemplify the selfless dedication and commitment to the gospel, even without seeking personal acclaim. Their contributions re remind us that every member of the body of Christ has a vital role to play, regardless of whether their deeds receive widespread recognition. So, God has given us all a gift. We all have a spiritual gift. And we all are one body. And we need your spiritual gift to work at its potential so that the body can work at its best. I, I, I mean, I'm not the pastor, I'm not the reverend, I'm not this, I'm not that, that's okay. But I am who I am. And because I am who I am, and I just do the best I can at what I do, believe me, my part is being taken, God is looking at my part and blessing it the way he wants it blessed. And he'll get the, he'll give the increase, and we'll be blessed behind what we do. So you gotta remember, it's, it's not about the title. It's not about that. It's about you doing what you're supposed to do. And, and God will bless you for that. The final chapter also serves as a warning to, man, to maintain unity and stay alert to divisive, in, divisive, divisive influences. The final doxology serves as a reminder that it is God who strengthens us as we strive to follow the gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. So, the main message of Romans in chapter 16 is unity, gratitude, and vigilance. And I was looking at that for a moment. It says unity and personal connection. Paul sends greetings to various individuals in the Roman church. These personal connections highlight the importance of unity within the body of Christ. Okay. The chapter emphasizes that believers are part of a larger family and their relationships matter. It's not just about doctrine. 
It's about genuine love and fellowship. Mm -hmm. We remember that and we'll do well. Right? So when the, the doctors come in, I, I was at a, a this was Congress one, one Saturday, and this young preacher came in, and there was a whole bunch of other doctors, I mean, pastors there that had doctors and all that stuff. He said, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little Volkswagen. I come in here like a Volkswagen, but I got all these 16 wheels. Right? And he said, I'm going to do my little part and get on out of the way. Right? Oh, but he was so in, in depth, and he was, he was really out of his game. But he said it like that to let everybody know that, look, hey, it ain't about, it ain't about title. Mm. If you go in and do what the Lord say do, believe me, somebody is going to benefit from it. And truly, I benefit from his lesson. As a matter of fact, we taught that, Pastor taught that class a couple, a couple of years ago. I'm trying to think of the name of it with the seven laws. Of, what was it? Seven uh, laws I can't of teaching. Seven laws of teaching. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He taught that. He taught that class back then. The pastor taught it. It was amazing. Calvin Andrews. You remember him? Yes. Very, very intelligent young man. And at that time, he had brought some of his students with him to teach as he taught the class. I remember very distinctly. Um, unity remains a timeless and vital principle for any community, including the modern day church. Here are some practical ways we can apply the message of unity today. Embrace diversity. Celebrate the diversity within the body of Christ. Like I said, hey, we all ain't the same. You don't think like I do, I don't think like you do. Well, Look, I, I made mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, out of this claim or two, and I'm going to get cheated off by you. Let me stop. Okay. Um, celebrate the diversity within the body of Christ. We come from various backgrounds, cultures, and traditions. Instead of allowing these differences to divide us, let's appreciate the richness they bring. Seek to understand and learn from one another. Engage in cross-cultural conversation and build bridges of understanding. We need to do this. And I'm glad to see that we have these, we have a lot of programs going on here that's outreach. And I understand we're going to start some other outreach programs. But the point is, they're not just black. You know, we have all different ethnic, ethnicities. And they all are part of the body of Christ, and they all will let you see. I'm serving just as tough as yours, and truly, you be sitting in awe at some of the sermons that uh, some of the way they talk about. They got it just like you got it. So I'm I'm celebrating and I'm embracing diversity. Mm -hmm. And then it says another way of unity, true of unity, is to practice love and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Love is the glue that holds us together. Show love to fellow believers. Even when disagreement arrives, you ain't gonna agree with me all the time. Forgive one another. Unity doesn't mean we won't have conflict. It means we choose to reconcile and extend grace. Pastor always tell Reverend Lewis, Reverend Lewis, err on the side of grace. It's err on the side of grace, brother. Amen, amen for grace. So, and serve together. Unity is not just about warm feelings. It's about action. Serve alongside others in your church or community. Somebody told me today, hey, you uh, you went to church. Huh? <laughs> Don't you miss Sunday next Sunday? I said, yes, ma'am, I won't miss church next Sunday. <laughs> so it, it's important. You know, we we look for one another on Sunday, on Wednesday, or on Friday. And when one of us not missing, brother, missing brother Jones, we miss you. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, we want you to know. And I know. And I realize that it's it's we're a family. Mm -hmm. And I love that about North Commission Baptist Church. We are family. You know, like I say, my parents raised us here, me and my four brothers. And uh, the love that was there then is still here now. Mm -hmm. One thing it, that didn't change. The love factor didn't change. And that's why I'm here. Because truly, what was about 500 people at, at Northern Baptist at the time? Now what we got about 80, 60. All of them. But the, but the love has not left. And that's what 
what, what's, what, what binds us. Um,
small group, be present, engage, build relationships. How can we be a community if we don't fellowship? Seek reconciliation. If there's a rift, seek reconciliation. Jesus emphasized reconciliation in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, where he said, So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer your gift. Reconciliation with the person who has something against you must take precedence even over offering one's gifts in worship. The one who initiated the reconciliation here is the one who has wronged the other person. Humbly approach the other person, listen and work for healing. Remember our common purpose. We're all part of the same mission, to share the gospel and make disciples. Keep the great commission found in the 28th chapter of Matthew, verses 19 to 20. And at the forefront of your heart and mind, oh, I said keep the, keep the great commission at the forefront of your heart and mind. Unity helps us fulfill this purpose of faith. Model unity in your family and workplace. Unity starts at home and extends to our workplace and communities. Be a peacemaker, promoting harmony wherever you go. My wife got a tendency to tell me, you are I got, I got three bosses. You know, I'm retired. I, mean, I, I say this all the time. I'm retired, right? I, mean, I work about 40 years. I'm retired. I get my retirement now. Y'all know that. I get my retirement now. Right, right. Yeah, I'm going to say that one time. I get my retirement now. Medical and everything. And I got three bosses still. I got a wife. I got a dog that's this big. But he's eight years old. I got a father. And then I got a pastor. <laughs> I got three bosses, still got bosses. Still got bosses. Good boss. Good boss. <laughs> so, be a peace, I, I'm a peacemaker. And I, I try to promote, promote harmony wherever I go. And I, I'm sure, I know, because I know everybody in here, mm -hmm. I know that you do the same thing. And I'm so, I'm more like, I'm more so speaking to you out. In, in the audience because, or on the, on the air because I don't know who all is out there. But please, be a peacemaker. Mm. Jesus honors that. Remember this, unity doesn't mean uniformity. <laughs> it's not what, it's about walking together despite our differences with Christ as our center. Mm. Let's live out this message daily. And then gratitude. Gratitude is another. As I told you before, the main message of Romans 16 is unity, gratitude, and vigilance. vigilance. That's why I'm speaking to you about this today. Mm -hmm. So, gratitude. Paul acknowledges the contribution of fellow workers who have labored alongside him in ministry. These unsung heroes are commended for their dedication. And they say, you can't tell it all. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't tell you everything right now. I really couldn't. 
But there's so many levels of understanding that I have learned that I can't fall because I have so much other learning that's going on in here in my mind that I know that I need to be doing, I can stand on this. So when you hear in church, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but when you're in church and in the getting in the know of what the Bible teaches, you can't fall because of all the stuff you already know. You may not, you may stumble at something that you don't know. But the things that you know become, I say it like this, the Holy Spirit will not let you down. Yes, yes. He's gonna stand there with you. And you're gonna know that he's right. He's doing it right now. Mm -hmm. To me, he's right here standing. He said, my word will not come back to me. Mm -hmm. You just teach the word as you have it. And you move forward. Mm -hmm. And believe me, he's going to bless you. And I'm so proud of that. It's just happy. I'm just, I'm just happy to be in the house of worship. <laughs> Being in the house of worship. Being able to say something positive for God. It's just a blessing. Mm -hmm. Look beyond titles and platforms. Don't be swayed by impressive titles on large platforms. False teachers can appear harmless, but have hidden motives. Remember Jesus' warning, beware of false prophets, who come to you in sheep clothes, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. That's Matthew 7, 15. <coughs> elevate, <coughs> elevate sincerity. Sincerity alone is not a guarantee of truth. Some false teachers may seem genuine, but their teaching can still lead you astray. Mm -hmm. Test everything against God's word. This is what you do. Yeah. So measure everything by scripture. God's word is the ultimate standard. When you encounter teaching, compare them to what the Bible says. If they are lying, embrace them. If not, reject them. So remember, vigilance against false teaching is not about suspicion or fear, but about safeguarding the purity of our faith. Stay rooted in God's truth and be watchful, just as the early believers were urged to do and be. Now, in summary, I was going to speak on doxology, but I'm going to. In summary, Romans 16 underscores the significance of relationships, gratitude, discernment, and worship in the Christian community. It is, called, it is a call to live out our faith in practice, in practical ways, honoring one another, and staying vigilant against anything that threatens unity. Mm -hmm. Now, though Paul had not yet been to Rome at the time of this writing, he knows many of the believers that they're personally or by reputation. He begins these greetings by commending a lady who will deliver this letter to him. Phoebe is a servant of the Church of Sinchir, a town not far from Corinth. I was reading uh, J. Bernard McGee's Through the Bible radio book on Romans, and he said when he went to uh, Corinth, he could look down the way and he could see Sinchir. So it was like 12 miles away, but you could see. And uh, so and Phoebe, she is described as a patron or benefactor to Paul and many others. Paul commended Phoebe. Then the reason why I went around to get to the first couple of verses in the 16th chapter, because like I said in the beginning of uh, beginning of the class, even though somebody denied that, our pastor told me he gonna be here next week, and I'm looking forward to him. We he's he's taught us Romans what 17 17 months now, mm -hmm. 16 chapters. 17 months. Do you know how much education came out of these 17 months? Mm -hmm. And believe me, I take every one. So in my lifetime, I can always go back and refresh my memory. And I thank you for the education you gave us, Pastor Mitchell. I truly do. And I'm looking so forward to seeing him finish this out for us mm -hmm. so that I can also, I mean, I'm being selfish here. I'm being selfish. I'm being selfish. I'm being selfish. So I can take this on along with me, you know, when I'm not able to attend church. You know, right. it's one thing to be able to come to church, but you know, I, we got some Brother Hamilton, Sister Robinson, 
bless their heart. They can come to church, but they wish they could be here. And if they had the strength to be here, they'd be here. There may come a time when I'm going to be here. But praise be to God, I have enough intelligence to take the things that this pastor was saying so that I can have that encouragement throughout the rest of my life. And I'm so thankful for the education that I'm receiving here. I take it personally because it's something that not only I'm learning, but I can share with others. And uh, truly, my wife is truly learning from it. And I'm, I'm proud to say that. Um, so, in talking about things, Paul commends speed to the church, to the Roman church, and sends personal greetings to a long list of individuals, including Priscilla and Paul, his fellow workers, and Andronicus and Julia, his kinsmen and fellow prisoners. So I'm saying, I'm saying, I said what I said, and that is brought back to my attention. Um, I didn't get involved in pastor because I didn't step on nobody. I didn't want to step on your toes because I know you're going to be deep when you come. And I, I want to be all the way out of the way. I do. Yeah, I really do. Um, he greets beloved friends, hard workers in the Lord, and those who were in Christ before him, underlining his deep affection and appreciation for these individuals. Romans 16, 1 and 2. Phoebe, which means bright and radiant, was Paul's emissary who delivered this letter. So he wrote officially, I commend to you our sister Eve. The relationship mentions his spirit. The relationship mentioned here is spiritual, not family. Phoebe was a servant of the Church of Centurion. And I was him looking at uh, I tell you, I, I, I like uh, J. Vernon McGee. J. Vernon McGee said one, one thing about this. Now, if you'd uh, if we'd have been putting the ladies in their place, he just in the, in the place where they should be all along. They didn't even have that authority, you know, moving that way, let them do what they do, because this fee was a tough sister. Yeah. And Paul had to recognize it. And he he gave up his letter to take to Rome. Yes, he did. You think he didn't trust this lady? Yeah, yeah. And not only that she was not he said not only was her, her personality and her you know how what, what is it? What do you mean? You, you, you always, what is the word? What is the word? It's a word that I'm going to say. Hospitality. Your hospitality. I, I love Sister Daniel. You two sisters love me, but Sister Daniel, I've known you a long time. And you, her hospitality is always up front. And I can, so when they talk about this previous hospitality, I see that. I see hospitality. I understand what Paul was saying. So what he did. Phoebe was a servant of the church of St. <laughs> and it is used in the office of the, as the office of the deacon, as well as used generally. Yeah. I'm sorry, Pastor, I gotta do it later. I'm gonna get to one of you later. of the church. Strongly suggests some recognition position and facts. So Paul not only commended her in 2 Corinthians 3 and 1, but also asked the Roman Christians to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she needs. Literally, he said, and to stand by her in whatever manner. And I, I agree with that 100 percent We as Christians we need to stand with one another, not because you're a woman, because you're a man, but because you're, 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 your faithfulness in the Lord is worthy of our, our, our appreciation. And we need to show it. And, and, I, and I know that's just what Paul is saying. Paul explains, for she has been a great help, he says, a protectress to many people, including me. Phoebe serves as a patron, probably with financial assistance and hospitality. That is. Mm -hmm. So they should help her since she had helped others. Mm -hmm. Next, Paul mentions Priscilla and Aquila. A married couple, Paul has spent much time with, both in the secular world of making tents and in the ministry. Aquila was forced to leave Rome when Jews were banned from the city. The 
apparently the prayer returned after the ban was lifted, perhaps accompanied by a man named Eponymus, and described as the first convert to Christ in the region where Priscilla and Aquila ministered. Paul first met Aquila and Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila when he arrived at Corinth on his second missionary journey. We find that in Acts 18 and 2. And worked with them at their trade of tent making. Mm -hmm. They had come to Corinth from Rome because of Claudius' decree that all Jews must leave Rome. They accompanied Paul when he left Corinth, but stayed in Ephesus when the party stopped briefly. There they ministered to Apollo and undoubtedly to Paul during his stay in Ephesus on his third journey. Because they sent greetings to the Corinthian Christians, he was found in his 1 Corinthians 16 and 9. Shortly after that, they must have moved back from Rome and still later returned to Ephesus. Paul paid them great praise, calling them my fellow workers in Christ, Jesus, and revealing that they risked their lives for me. They laid down their own necks for my soul. In what way they act, they risked their lives was not known. All the Gentile churches, Paul added, were grateful to them. So what they tell me, Paul knew very distinctly a whole lot of people in Rome, though he had not made it to Rome yet. And believe it or not, I had that in my notes and I, I lost it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I get. But the, the time to follow notes, I understand. But Paul knew a lot of people in Rome, even before he had gotten to Rome. So he wrote this letter in hopes that the Christians there, they would emphasize to the Christians in Rome that Paul the Apostle, who is deserving of our help, is on his way to us to be help, help on his way to Spain. Paul had always, Paul was, his vision was to get, to go to Spain. He was going to spread the word. But I understand that when he got to Jerusalem with the, with the offering, to the, to the saints in Jerusalem, they put him in prison. And, he, and as far as we know, well, as far as I know, he never he made it to Rome, but he made it to Rome not the way he thought he was going to make it to Rome. Yeah. He made it as a prisoner and not as a free man. <clears throat> so, but that's a whole other story. Because, see, Paul's life didn't end there. What? Well, he was his prison epistles? Oh, mm -hmm. Paul was still busy even in prison. Paul, he said, what he said? Uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but it's the power of God unto the same thing that everybody will believe. Jew, right. Persian, and Gentile. All he right. said that Paul said, I, 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 Paul stood, Paul stood what he stood for. And he, and he wasn't, he wasn't backslidden. He wasn't backstepping for, for nobody. He said, death, what can, he said, matter of fact, what he said, look, I, I'd rather die. It's better for me. It's better for you than I stay here. Because, see, me, I prefer to go to be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. But because of what I have to offer you, it's better than I, it's, he's, he feels God feels it better than I stay right now. So, Paul was not afraid of that. And um, we have to be, and I ain't, I ain't, I ain't saying I ain't afraid of that. Because it ain't an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to it, if we were to have to make a decision, Death or deny Christ, what you gonna do? I gotta take death, I gotta be like Paul. I mean, Christ paid it all. And because he paid it all, I owe him. Whether or not I'm afraid, that's that's not the case. That's not the point. Yeah, I'm be afraid, I'd be afraid to get killed. What they say. Cut Paul's head off. Then they did this idea that he cut his head off. He wasn't afraid. He went there anyway. You know, and said, hey, look, that's, 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 that's the price I gotta pay. They crucified Christ. If they crucified the Savior, what about us? You know, who are we? You know, so I have to have that type of attitude in spite of what what I the, the, what else going on in my world for the rest of my life. You know, like I said, I always say I'm 70. I'm happy to be 70. <laughs> my brother didn't make 70. Nor did my uncle that I graduated with. Nor did my cousin that I graduated with. They didn't make 70. So when I say 70, I'm thankful to be 70. Truly, I'm thankful to be here. 
that said, this is a blessing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I feel stronger than I ever did. I feel more encouraged about worshiping the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, who was that Sister Robinson said? Your mother and dad are proud of you, Lord. And, you know, I believe that, Sister Robinson. I truly do. And I'm truly thankful to be a, be a part of the body of Christ. I came here for one purpose, to give you what I had. Okay, and believe me, that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. 